Good evening. My name is Charles Richardson. I am the current principal of East High School. And on behalf of our current Tigers, we want to re welcome all of you Tigers back to the Tiger Land. We all know the old saying that once a tiger, all right, with that, I would like to introduce now at this time our, our superintendent here, Dr. John Stanford. Well, good evening, everyone. We are so very, very happy to have you all here with us tonight at the historic Columbus East High School Tigers. As Mr. Richardson said, I am John Stanford. I'm the interim superintendent of Columbus City Schools. You know, when I moved to Columbus 31 years ago, one of the iconic places that everyone talked about was the great Columbus East High School. And when I walked through the halls at that time and saw all of the great pictures of all of those who had come before us, it was very, very impressive. And so we are here tonight to celebrate the greatness demonstrated by a group of young men 50 years ago. They are a part of the rich and deep, robust legacy here at Columbus East High School. So now please stand up and join me in welcoming the players of the 1968-1969 East High School State Championship teams in basketball and baseball. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use some interim superintendent privilege here and ask the coach to come and lead that cheer that he led last night. y'all ready for this? Hey, you young tigers that don't know this, just pay attention. You'll catch on. <laughs> well, I went down to the river oh, and I started to drown. Oh, I got to thinking about the tigers oh, and I couldn't go down. Oh, so I went down to the railroad. Oh, I put my big head on the track. I got to thinking about the Tigers. I pulled my big head back. It takes a rocking chair to rock. It takes a basketball to roll. It takes a team like the Tigers to satisfy my soul. Are you satis, 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 satisfied? Are you satis, 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 satisfied? Are you satis, 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 satisfied? Satisfies my soul. Woo!
Now that's what I call a start, a great, great start to a great evening. Woo! Again, we are thrilled in Columbus City Schools that you all can join us tonight as we celebrate these hometown heroes and a man that is a walking tribute to the great African tradition of the Village Griot. The Village Griot's name is award-winning author Will Haygood. And I have the honor and privilege tonight to celebrate the national release of his book with you all, Tigerland, 1968-1969, A City Divided, A Nation Torn Apart, and A Magical Season of Healing. Tigerland tells the story of East High School's basketball and baseball teams who won state championship titles during the 1968-1969 school year amid the racial turbulence and segregation of that time. It is also the story of how one of our city's great educational leaders, the, infam the, the famous Jack Gibbs, <laughs> held this community and this school together during those difficult days. We are thrilled and humbled in Columbus City Schools that Mr. Haygood came home to release his new book to the nation. Mr. Haygood attended Columbus City Schools in elementary, junior high, and the 10th grade right here at East High School. He earned his bachelor's degree from Ohio's Miami University. He then went on to serve as a national and foreign correspondent for the Boston Globe and the Washington Post. So he has made us very proud. He has written eight books. He is also the associate producer of The Butler. And I hope you all remember The Butler. It is a prize-winning film that starred, among others, Oprah Winfrey, Forrest Whitaker, Cuba Gooding Jr., Mariah Carey, and Jane Fonda. The Butler movie was based on his book, The Butler, A Witness to History. And I have to tell you that it is one of the greatest movies that I've seen in my lifetime. Yes. Mr. Haygood recently received from his alma mater the President's Medal, which is the highest honor bestowed by Miami University and given, and, uh, and given in honor of his work in Tigerland. He is also the first African American writer to have a street named after him on Miami University's campus. So again, tonight's appearance launches Mr. Hager's national book tour across America for Tigerland, where he will be talking about the many triumphs of the great 1968-1969 East High School Tigers. And now, please join me in welcoming our own Mr. Will Haygood back to East High School in the city of Columbus. I come home to this city and I ride around town. 
early in the mornings, late at night, Broad Street, Long Street, Monroe Avenue. And I reminisce about my years as a public school student here in this city. It is a hard job teaching. Teachers are never praised enough. And people fought during the Civil War to keep public schools open. To the students and to the young in our audience tonight, life in these times can seem somewhat complicated. On some days, heroes look like villains, and villains look like heroes. But one of the great lessons in American society erupted in this building right here in 1968. Our moral leader, Martin Luther King Jr., had been snatched from us. Then weeks later, the warm heart of Robert F. Kennedy was also taken from us. And so people had to look and find heroes where they could. Were they really in a sports team of basketball players? Could they have been figures over at Harley Field playing baseball? It has been said that sometimes God writes straight and crooked lines. For those students who think these times are hard, I say to you, there was a player who came to this community from Bell Fountain, Ohio. He wanted to play basketball and baseball. And so he did. He starred for three years at East High School on the varsity basketball team and the varsity baseball team. He went on to Long Beach State University. He became a first-team college All-American. He was a member of the U.S. men's Olympic team. He played for the NBA Houston Rockets. Students, if you need to be lifted up, history now in the pages of Tigerland has given you your role model. Ladies and gentlemen, the golden boy, Ed Ratliff. drove these players, one might ask. Was it the love of the game, or was it something that you just really can't touch? So here was a player who lived near a bar. Every day, he heard glasses of people drinking. 
and people roaming the alley. He got on his bicycle and he went to the playgrounds. He went to the playgrounds that summer because Coach Bob Hart told him he might not make that basketball team in the fall of 1968. He too was hurt by the death of Martin Luther King Jr. But he told himself that he was going to make this school proud. And when the school doors opened and the hallways were full of pain, he lifted himself up with all the skills that he had garnered that summer. And he became a starter. He went on to Citrus Junior College. He was the unsung hero of that 1968-1969 season. He rode through dark alleys to get to a moment of true brightness. Students, if you need a role model, you'll find none better than the great Roy Hickman. These players all had wonderful mothers. But they did not wear fancy dresses to work. They wore old clothes. They wore aprons. Eight of the 12 basketball players, mothers, worked on their hands and knees. They were maids. They had escaped in the American South to better life, better life, to make a better life for their sons. There can be no larger measure of a woman who we know will go in, into the jaws of a lion to keep her children safe. And when this woman told her son that she was outraged that he had been let go of the team at North High School because he had a big, fluffy, dazzling, beautiful afro, his mother was upset. And when her son asked him, he said, Mama, what should I do? She told him she did not pack their bags and get on the train and come north to sacrifice her family's dignity. And so that player found a route to East High School. He had been left behind on another part of town, but he found a home here. He only played here one year, and he got a scholarship to the University of Southwestern Louisiana. He led the entire nation in scoring. He became a first-team college All-American. He made history because he and his running mate, Eddie Rat Ratliff, remain the only two players who made first team college All-American who came from the same high school in the same year. He played in the ABA and in the NBA. Ladies and gentlemen, the unforgettable Dwight Bo Pete Lamar.
It is hard to be tall and stout because other teams are going to send their most ferocious player after you. And, but the Tigers that year had a very big tiger. And he had a very big roar. And he loved his teammates. And they loved him. He became a very cagey player for the East High School Tigers. He came from a wonderful family and he found a second family here. Ladies and gentlemen, another unique member of that 1968-69 state championship basketball team, Mr. Kevin Smith. How do sophomores make a basketball team? Well, they have to be very good. Actually, they have to be amazing. And they have to have some sort of connection with the juniors and the seniors on the team. And there was one sophomore who played on that 1968-1969 state championship team. He went on to Bowling Green State University where he had a mighty fine career on the football field. Ladies and gentlemen, the young kid from that team, Hal Thomas. And when you think about legacy, then you have to think of this next gentleman. He was a thief in the night. He stole the basketball on many courts including the stage right here. He went on to Citrus Junior College, and he coached the 1979 state championship basketball team here at East High School. Ladies and gentlemen, all the way from Indianapolis, Larry Walker. The richness of that year, the pain and the glory. How do you find this kind of astonishing glory? You find it because the players loved each other. They studied hard and they stayed eligible. This player's family came from the American South. He blasted the ball into the cornfields at the schools where he heard racial slurs ringing in his ear. It only made him play harder. He played catcher and he played third base and sometimes he even pitched. He was an all-state catcher. He was drafted by the New York Mets, who would later that year win the World Series. Students, if you need a role model, listen to this. His daddy was locked up when he was scoring those winning runs. And his mother was walking these hallways, writing letters to his daddy, telling him about their son's exploits. Students, no matter what anybody says in the White House, you have all the heroes and the models that you need right here.
I introduce you to the all-state catcher, the one-time New York Mets, the all-everything at East High School on the baseball diamond, the soul of that team, Mr. Garnett Davis. There was a war going on. And any boy in the home who had brothers, one brother or maybe two brothers, away fighting in the Vietnam War, wanted to hold his family together. This player would be inspired when he would get letters from his brothers, brothers, plural, two, who were away fighting in the Vietnam War. It's wrong for people who have never served in the military to think they know what military patriotism is. <laughs> this player knew he was playing as much for East High School as he was playing for his two brothers in the Vietnam War. Students, if you need a role model, if you have any doubts morning, noon, or night about your position or your station in life, know that it is glorious and the road has been paved for you by people like the one and only Ray Scott. <laughs> this next person's family hailed from the South. There were nine children in the family. Some days, he admitted to me, he didn't get enough to eat. So he got a job at Carl Brown's IGA. Sometimes he was so tired, he wore his baseball cleats to work. Imagine that, students, 15 years old, working a job and throwing beautiful left-handed pitcher pitches on the baseball diamond. Students, young people, if you need any more incentive that you can make it in this world, Look up to the exploits of Mr. Ernie Locke. His picture hangs here in the hallways. He was an amazing basketball player. He was Eddie Rat's running mate. They outlawed dunking then, high school dunking, and sometimes he would dunk to get a technical foul and would just stand there. <laughs> How you like me now? He played in the Big Ten at Illinois. So we can have a moment of silence for the one and only great Nikki Connor. I say to you,
if there was justice in the world, then these two teams who did something historic would have wound up on a box of Wheaties. But it was Dr. King himself who walked these very streets out front with his friend, the Reverend Fell Hell. It was Dr. King himself who said that the, that the long moral arc of justice ultimately swings in the right direction. So a little kid grows up moves to the east side, he's 13 years old, and he sees some of these giants in the flesh on the local playgrounds. Little Will Haygood felt that he had landed in the world of Oz. <laughs> oh, to see Roy Hickman, to see Bo Lamar on the playground to be at the fairgrounds and to see the wondrous Eddie Rat Ratliff, to hear about Garnett Davis, that long arm of justice. It worked out okay. Because now these players may not have made it onto a box of Wheaties, but they made it for all time into the pages of Tigerland. It is an amazing story. It is an astonishing story. It is a story whose time has come. And I'm just a vessel. I saw the story, and I wanted to write it. There are people in this room who aided that story, who were there, who gave sustenance and solace to those students. And if we can turn up the lights, I would like and to introduce a few of these unique people. This was the house that Jack built. Jack Gibbs. He was a rare human being. He came from Harlan, Kentucky. He lost a little sister. When he was a young boy, he was haunted by that. He put it in his mind that he was never going to leave a child behind if he could. And he worked tirelessly to do that. He left us far too long, far too early. He was only 55 years old. It is not our duty to question what happens down here on Earth. But I'm a lucky man because I had an opportunity to take a trip to Harlan, Kentucky with the family of Jack Gibbs because I wanted to research his life and his story. The family of Jack Gibbs is here, and I would like them to stand up.
It is the Jack Gibbses of America who have made this country great. And Betsy DeVos and all her ideas are no match for the Jack Gibbses of America. In the coach. In the coach. He came from the west side of the city. His father told him, I don't care what the other kids are saying about blacks. There will be no racial slurs in this house. And that coach, as a boy and as a man, he took that to heart. And he wanted to be here. He was the assistant basketball coach. He was the head baseball coach of the 1968-69 champions. This book happens to be dedicated to both Jack Gibbs and this man, Mr. Paul Pinnell. Where does a coach find his direction in life? It is a question full of mystery. Bob Hart, who coached in, in the 1969 basketball team to a state championship, landed in Normandy in World War II Bullets were flying everywhere. He survived. He did not like what he saw was happening to soldiers who were black, how they were treated in the second class jobs and that those soldiers had. When he finished college, he wanted to teach. He had a senior thesis in his bag. His senior thesis was titled The Unfair Treatment of the Black Soldier in World War II. So when Bob Hart landed at East High School amidst all of these black faces, he was happy. <laughs> he was ready to get to work. He thought he could do something to make America a much better place. He wanted so badly to be in the Ohio Hall of Fame before he passed. He got sick and he kept telling his daughters that. It didn't happen. He passed away and then they put him in the Hall of Fame. It's all right, Coach Hart because Tigerland is also dedicated to you. Yeah. And I would like the entire family of the great coach Bob Hart to rise. I personally love coaches. 
even those who cut me for the teams I tried out for. <laughs> Although, I really can't wait for the fall season to start and the leaves to start falling and the crisp snowflakes to start falling. I was just honored at my alma mater, Miami University, with a varsity letter jacket. <laughs> and I played on the junior varsity basketball team. I was a walk-on and I set the bench. <laughs> but it dawns on me, I'm, <laughs> I may very well be the most undistinguished yet celebrated athlete in the history of Miami University. <laughs> Speaking of coaches, I'm trying to find Mr. Bob Marsh. He might not be here. There, stand up. Mr. Marsh coached several of these players when they were young and before they got to East High School. Stay standing, coach, for a minute. He came here all the way from Phoenix, Arizona with his wife. And here, here is the magic of sports. All of the Tigers know it. I wanted so badly and to play and to make the Monroe, Monroe varsity basketball team. <laughs> and I went out for the team and I made it, barely, but I made it. <laughs> and the first game happened and I didn't get in the game. I set the bench. And I walked home sad. The second game happened. I said, surely the coach is going to put me in this game. We're up 15 points, for heaven's sake. <laughs> so I didn't get in that game either. I'm thinking, whoa, wow. So the third game happened. Again, Haygood sits the bench the whole game. And the fourth game came and it was against my former junior high school in Genola Junior High. And all of my former schoolmates on the north side were looking at me. <laughs> oh, well look at Will, he done made the team, okay. Uh, Will done came over here on the east side and made the team, wow. First quarter pass, and I just wanted to get, you know, just two seconds, coach. Yeah, you know, I just want to be out there with the guys. But no, Will doesn't get in the game the first quarter, doesn't get in the game the second quarter. Halftime, I'm like mumbling to myself. I just, I'm sick of this coach. I wonder if he even knows what he's doing. <laughs> and the third quarter comes, and in Genola, it's called for a technical foul. And a technical foul means that they've done something so awful that everybody has to clear the court. And the team, Monroe, has to choose a player <laughs> to go to the foul line and shoot the free throw. <laughs> and I'm wondering, looking down the, you know, looking down the bench, who the coach is going to choose. You know, he's probably going to choose Bobby Chandler or, or maybe Johnny. And then I hear a voice. Hey, good. <laughs> Lord have mercy, I thought I was going to faint. <laughs> and I take off my sweats. I wasn't used to taking my sweats off. That was a new sensation for me. 
I take off my sweats and my top, and I run to the free throw line. Had never played a second all season. <laughs> and now the coach is asking me with no warm-ups to shoot a free throw. Yeah, cold free throw. And all of my teammates are looking at me with their hands on the hips. <laughs> and just before I shot, somebody, still trying to find out who it is, said, shoot the damn ball, scarecrow. <laughs> and I had to bounce the ball five times again so I can get my rhythm back. <laughs> and I stood there, and it was like a scene in a movie. I shot the ball, and it floated, and it floated, and it floated, and it floated. <laughs> and then it went swish. And I went, I went to visit Coach Marsh for one of the books that I was working on. He took me down this basement and he said, I have something to show you. And I had no idea what it was. And he pulled out the record book from that year. And there it was, hey good, 00-1. It was beautiful. <laughs> Oh my God, he's bought my one point. He's bought my one point with him. Oh my God. That, that, ladies and gentlemen, that's the beauty of why we play the game. Because every day we go into school, we do not know what is going to happen. The East High Tigers surprise the world. I spent four years on the book, and I look at you all now. I look at you players. I look at you coaches. And I very proudly say, and I say this to the East High Tigers everywhere, the great sports teams in this country, somehow, they always find a writer. Friday Night Lights, or maybe Moneyball, those books that we know so well. I say to you, Tigers, Will Haygood's mission is now complete. Amen. Love this book. <laughs> Love this book, not because I wrote it, but love this book for the stories that are in it. And for the students, black, white, Asian, students from Somalia, wherever. For the wonderful public school students or the Catholic school students who it will inspire. I'm happy to have played a role in the life of Tigerland. God bless you. Amazing, outstanding, history, legacy, electricity. Thank you, Will Haygood, for bringing history home. Please, let's give Mr. Haygood another Tigerland applause.
Tigerland in the house. At this time, we want to open the microphone for questions from the audience. To have this opportunity, this privilege, to ask our author, our distinguished Broadway premier award-winning homeboy any question that you would like to ask him. Once again, at this time, the microphone is on the floor and it's open. Hello. <laughs> I have a question about how you balanced the unifying theme of state championships against the segregation and the divided history behind it. What were you thinking as you were writing to balance the two? And did you weigh one more than the other? Mm -hmm. um, well, um, one of the things that it was very critical to me in doing this book is that I did not want it to be you know, a straightaway sports book. And so there was so much happening in this nation at the time and that I knew and I really wanted to go back and forth in the book. And so while there's maybe one chapter on the sports season and that second chapter might shift, like uh, there's a chapter in the book titled what the mothers feared most. And that's about Emmett Till, the 15-year-old boy who was murdered in Mississippi in 1955 for whistling at a white woman. And Emmett Till's story in 1969 did not seem so far removed from the mothers who had been in the South in the 1950s. And so that, um, and that sort of gave me a wonderful segue from sports to real life to sports and to real life. And I figured if I could tell both sides of the American story happening at that time, it would make what these athletes did amidst all that fire and pain so much more remarkable. Not a single player, thank God, got shot in the back by a law enforcement officer. Hi, Will. Um, I want to ask a more general question about journalism. You're such a brilliant writer. And Excuse me? You're such a, <laughs> such a brilliant writer. Um, and, and you're able to provide context for all that you write about. And that seems missing to me in journalism now. So I'm, I'm curious what you think about how any of the stories that we see in the news are covered, what you would suggest to give us more, um, a greater understanding of what's really happening in our world from a journalistic perspective. Yeah, I was very fortunate in that I found two wonderful newspapers and that gave writers a whole lot of space to write their stories. And I was at the Boston Globe for many years and then I was at the Washington, Washington Post, and those newspapers had, you know, space for writers to write stories. Um, and now the space in so many newspapers has 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 shrunk. It's just a smaller news hole, uh, and so I now I now like to sing my music, if you will in 350 page, 400 page books. Uh, you know, but as I tell students, if you have a good rich story, 
some editor will find a way to get that story into print. Great stories do not go untold. Sometimes it takes a writer who has an extra maybe ear to find a story or to come up with a story idea. Uh, thus, in 2008, I wanted to find some African-American figure, male or female, who had worked in the White House during the era of segregation. And one thing led to another, to another, to another, and I found this butler. Uh, and so, and I think it's up to journalists and writers to keep looking harder for those stories that haven't been told. This East High story was sitting out there for 50 years. And, and I'm just so glad that all the players welcomed me into their homes when I was working on this book. Roy Hickman met me on the far west side. And, uh, and uh, he treated me to a fish sandwich. <laughs> that was all. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, yes. Um, was there anything of all the things um, that you did include in the book, was there a theme or a person or a particular story that you just, in the final analysis, had to not put in that you think of that you're like, mm, if I just, if, you know, is there, is there something that particularly hurt you or challenged you about not being able to put in the book? Um. You know, if I had gotten a letter, a letter from my editor, and that he wanted to and maybe cut a whole chapter from the book, uh, I just wouldn't have been very happy. Um, and so, all the things I wanted in this book are there. Uh, there were some rich stories, though, that I found. For instance, Martin Luther King Jr. had a connection to this city and because of uh, Reverend Fell Hell. And they were friends. And Reverend Hell, he gave, he gave Martin Luther King, Martin Luther King Jr.'s eulogy in this city when King died. Reverend Fell Hell's son is here. I'd like him to stand up. Hilt Hilton Hell. One more question right here. I, okay. I, the first thing I want to do is congratulate these guys because back then, you know, I, we really didn't know what you guys were doing. We just knew y'all were good. <laughs> so winning was just part of it, you know. But now all these years later, that was really amazing. I mean, what you guys did, really amazing. Now, I'm going to start a little trouble because Will does a lot of research. Now, the, the rumor that was out was you guys did not lose a game. I know that one. I'm not going to say anything because Clemens sitting over there against Lyndon <laughs> back here at. I don't say. But the rumor was that the only team that beat you guys that wasn't public was the high Y. Now, that's been a rumor. And so I'm thinking that we can get that straight right now. Did you do any research about it? I'm not trying to cause any trouble. But that, did you hear that too? You heard that too? So we gonna get the, can we get that straight now? <laughs> that, that, that. It was just a rumor? Okay. Excuse me. That entire story is in the book. That entire story is in this book. Uh, there are two phenomenal athletes who I've just spotted who are here, Mr. Donnie Penn and Mr. Jim Clemens. I'd like them to stand up. Great athletes. And since we only have time, hold on for two more, 
to more questions. I think we're going to take them from the students. Where are those students at who were standing? Okay, why don't the students come on up to the microphone? Yeah. We're going to have it for the students. Sorry, yep. Where are those students at? Where are those students at? She just said me with the Huh? They're coming down now. Okay. All right. But I like. Because people are going with mobs. Yes. We almost need a police officer. Okay, the students. Students. Sorry. Okay. I'm, your, I'm only a former student. But I would like. I would like to acknowledge that one of our boosters here and one of our basketball players, Granville Waiters, he's here. Would you recognize him, please? Okay. I would like, in the great East High School, an Ohio State player, former Chicago Bull player, Mr. Granville Waiters, to stand up. Okay, <laughs> students, students, you're up. Okay. You're up, sweetheart. <laughs> so what adversities did you face while writing the book? And at any point in time, did you feel kind of discouraged to continue on, like, throughout the process? That's the question. This book, right? Yes. Yeah, she asked me what Ad adversity did I face in writing this book? And did I ever feel like quitting? And that's a real, real smart question. Because there were days uh, when I would get tired of looking at microfish <laughs> in the library, squinting to see how many points Ed Ratliff scored. Squinting, and um, but even on those tired days, I realized I was writing about champions, and that these and that these young men, and they were champions, and before they shot a basketball and before they swung a baseball bat. And with that in mind, I really woke up each morning full of pride and joy that I was writing their story. And I think if you have a story that you love and that you really want to do, there is absolutely no sadness associated with that. Okay? Mm -hmm. Hi, how are you? I'm fine. That's good. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I know a lot of African American writers felt restricted with the publishing, so were, do you feel like you were restricted when you're writing this book or other ones that you've written? Mm -hmm. um, no, no. <laughs> Editors just want great stories. Editors want good stories. I mean, and they really do. Um, and so if you decide and to be a writer, and I can guarantee you that smart editors and smart publishers are waiting on your prose up in New York City. They're waiting. They're waiting. Thank you very much, and I think it's time to go sign some books. <laughs>